My name is Russ Petrus. I'm co-director of Future Church. Uh, uh, with me tonight on the call is Deb Rose Milovac, uh, my colleague, friend, and partner at Future Church. And on behalf of the, the two of us, our staff and our board, it's just a, a real joy to welcome all of you here tonight for this, our first art tour. Uh, we're really, really excited about it. Uh, before we go uh, too much further, I just want to uh, lay out some ground rules for the evening and uh, give you some information. We will be recording this tele or this conference so that others who signed up or could not join us for some reason uh, will be able to, to, to view it back. So uh, just please know that unless you choose to ask a question during the question and answer time, you won't appear in the video. So only those people who have a speaking role uh, will on track so we can make this a good 60 to 75 minutes or so. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, there will be a Q&A session after the presentation. So if something pops into your mind and maybe you want to jot it down somewhere or even um, uh, type it on, on, uh, on your computer just so that you have uh, that in your memory bank, that would be great. Uh, during the q and I'll go over the instructions on how we're going to do that. It seems appropriate that gathering as a people of faith, we would begin in prayer. And so we pray. We seek you out, O God of justice, just as Mary Magdalene did that first Easter with troubled hearts and minds. We grieve precious lives lost and vulnerable lives threatened by pandemic. Reckon with the violence and injustice we have perpetrated against people of color. We struggle with a church institution that excludes, abuses, dehumanizes, and turns away. And so, in faith, we place our collective holy of sadness frustration, fear, confusion. We place all of these before you along with our hopes and our dreams. Reveal your resurrecting power to us, we pray, as once you did for Mary Magdalene, who stayed weeping at the tomb. Renew us with your presence this day and send us forward with brave and willing bodies and spirits to co-create with you and to bring forth new life, wholeness of life for each of us, for all of us. We make this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to turn things over to Rita Houlihan, who is a uh, future, longtime Future Church member and uh, currently uh, renewing her term on the board of Future Church, so we thank Rita for that. But uh, Rita has been an absolutely tireless advocate for um, restoring the, the true scriptural memory uh, and historical memory of Mary of Magdala. And so um, she's helped us um, put, uh, put this event together and uh, knows Dr. Better than either myself or Deb, so we thought it would be much better for Rita to introduce her. Thank you, thank you so much, Russ, and it's a delight to uh, see and hear everyone. I just always love hearing all the wide, dispersed places um, where, from where Mary Magdalene advocates emerge. Um, so it is. I am absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Christine Axon a medieval historian and professor at Fordham and as of this fall at Manhattan College, my father's um, alma mater, up here in uh, New York City. So uh, Christine earned her PhD in medieval history at Boston University in 2015. She researches Episcopal history uh, female and female religiosity of the 13th century um, with a specific interest in mapping sacred place and landscapes, medieval bishops and their sources of power, spirituality and physicality in the Middle Ages, and 
most relevant to us tonight, Medieval Legacies in Our Modern Era. Currently, uh, Dr. Axon is developing a project that uses Latin charters or contracts to explore the religious life of the nuns of St. Catherine's Convent in 13th century Avignon, France. With a focus on the relationship between the bishop and the nuns, female religiosity and sacred space. So I met Christine last November, pre-COVID, when I took two wonderful young ladies, uh, former uh, tutoring students of mine, Gigi and Maya, who are forever curious and always wanting to explore. So I said, let's go to the cloisters and let's book a tour. Well, little did we know <laughs> that we would meet Christine. So um, I have to say, Christine led us and 50 other somewhat cantankerous New Yorkers, some of them, on one of the most energetic, detailed, and exciting tours I've ever been on in any part of the Metropolitan Museum. Um, for anyone who hasn't been to the Cloisters, uh, please look it up online. They have some beautiful um, images, and it's on Upper Manhattan. You can see the Hudson River, the Palisades, down to the George Washington Bridge. It's, it's spectacular, and it really reproduces um, parts of actual cloisters that came over from uh, Western Europe. So this virtual art tour grew out of um, the interests of multiple Mary Magdalene advocates. First at Xavier Parish, where last year, when we looked at action items, we could take to uh, press forward and, and help many, many people become familiar with the real Mary Magdalene. One of the ideas came about of advocating to museums to change the labels on some of the art. And then very specifically, um, Christine Santos Duran suggested, well, let's take an art tour. And I was like, how can I do that? You know, I'm not an expert. And then, um, then lo and behold, uh, I don't know, five or six months ago, the Ben and Casa community suggested also an art tour. And then I was like, well, I don't have to do it. I can ask Christine, you know, or another expert. And um, so I just wanted to say it's been an utter pleasure working with Christine to develop the, um, the, the material. She's doing the, 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 the heavy lifting. Um, but I just would like to share, because I, I know people appreciate this very often, uh, some of the texts that we use that are easily available, thank heavens. Um, and one of them is Mary Magdalene, The Essential History. Um, and it's, there are a couple of versions of this. One is called Myth and Metaphor. I recommend The Essential History, the Pimlico edition, 2005. This is a fantastic reference. It doesn't go into scripture, but it goes into the whole history of what happened to her. And it's, it's, it's a great reference book. And then this one, the Mary Magdalene cover-up um, by Esther DeBoer, which documents every um, early text up through uh, the late sixth century. Um, and, and has commentary from Esther on the meaning of it. So every text that refers to Mary Magdalene, both scripture, non-scriptural, the critiques from, you know, uh, you know it's, it's fascinating. But this is for another day when we're doing more early history. But um, this is where the idea to start with Gregory the First and his um, analysis that Mary Magdalene, he said in 591 or 592, did not come away from the resurrection, um, he doesn't deny that she was a witness, but what he says is she went seeking mercy as a sinful woman, and she came back with a message of mercy. So you're gonna see Christine will illustrate that many times. So in the Middle Ages, that wasn't terrible. And they, they, they balanced both of that, this sinful woman of authority. But later you'll see how that deteriorates. But it was, it's Esther DeBoer's insight um, into the, the damage done by that interpretation, Gregory the First interpretation of her resurrection witness. And then this is a new one to me, fabulous, the making of Mary Magdalene, um, preaching and popular devotion in the later Middle Ages by Catherine Jansen, uh, Ludwig Jansen. And uh, both Christine recommended this and also Francine Cardman, who gave the annual Boston College Mary Magdalene lecture. I highly recommend you can get that on the Boston College continuing education um, website uh, with, uh, I think it was 2018 or 17, I can't remember, around there, but Francine Harden did a fabulous job. So with no further ado, please welcome Dr. Christine Axon. 
Thank you so much. And thank you to Future Church and especially Rita for getting me involved in this Reclaim Magdalene project. This is just absolutely wonderful. And I'm so delighted to speak to you all tonight. I will try to speak slowly, but I'm a New Yorker. So if I go a little too fast, please let me know and I will slow down again. I get carried away when I get excited. Okay, so I'll be sharing my screen with you so you can watch this PowerPoint alongside me. Okay. And essentially, what we will do today is to track the change in Mary Magdalene's popular identity from the earliest artwork that we have of her through the early modern period. And the reason that this is useful is because it shows us, in a sense, the kind of living production of Mary Magdalene's changing as we're moving forward in through different historical periods, each of which adds something or removes something from her story. It's important to note also that we are starting off with biblical sources. This is our core of information about Mary Magdalene, and she appears 14 times by her name, uh, 12, 12 times by her full name, and two when she is clearly the only woman present in the four canonical gospels. And these are written somewhere between about 60, so maybe a generation after the death of Jesus, through about maybe 110 as a sort of end date for the Gospel of John. So they're being written in a community that is understanding its own stories and recording them for posterity. So from the Gospels, what do we actually know about Mary Magdalene? And I've made a chart here based on Rita's research to just sort of illustrate the points of agreement between the four canonical Gospels. We know that Mary Magdalene was an important disciple who traveled with Jesus from Galilee. Luke says that she was healed of seven demons, and this will come back to be important momentarily. She stayed at the cross at Jesus' death, took the very important responsibility of anointing his body after death, which is a practice that was reserved for a close female family member in the Jewish tradition in the first century. She was a witness to the resurrection, perhaps the first, perhaps among several. She was authorized to preach and then undertook that authorized preaching mission. And you'll note that I put arrows where the four gospels all agree. And at the end of the lecture, I hope that you can look back at this chart and see the huge disparity between where Mary Magdalene starts from the original closest to her life sources to where we wind up in the 16th and 17th centuries with depictions of the Magdalene. So just very quickly first, I'm gonna show you two pieces of art that are among the earliest of Mary Magdalene. And you'll note that they do not show her undressed in a penitent, sinful sort of way. This is a woman who is a witness to the resurrection who is being blessed by Jesus. So what you see here are the carved cypress doors of the Basilica of Santa Sabina in Rome. And this is one of the earliest known images of Mary Magdalene and other women who go to the tomb. And this dates to about 400. So this is quite early in the development of the institutional church, right? We're just getting our texts down. We're just trying to figure out the organization and infrastructure of the church as it's growing. Um, it's only becoming a legal, a legal religion in the fourth century. So this is still very new. And so these are seminal images that help us understand how these communities understood Mary Magdalene in the earliest period. So we can see she would be one of the women here and Jesus is doing a blessing. And this is a really typical medieval hand gesture to indicate blessing. The next image here is an ivory pyx and a pyx is the container that would hold the Eucharist. And so this is linking the story of the first witnesses to the resurrection with that central aspect of the liturgy, the trans, the, um, sorry, the Eucharistic mass. So you'll see three figures here on the left hand side. And so you're seeing all around the rounded picks, which has its little lid. And these women are in a position known as the Orons figure where they have their hands sort of cactus with the palms up. And this is a well known pagan and Jewish symbol of prayer. They are mid prayer in this. They're not huddling in fear. They are wrapped in their devotion. And on the opposite side of the picks, you can see uh, an uh, altar place that resembles or that represents the open tomb of Jesus that is now empty. And the curtains pulled back here are um, indicative of what actually these temples looked like in the Eastern Mediterranean in the early uh, second millennium. So what you have here is this story unfolding around the edge of the picks. And again, nowhere present here is any penitent sinner. We have the witnesses to the resurrection and the women who go to the tomb. So these are the kinds of images that you see in the earliest depictions of Mary. 
And then over the course of the next half hour, I'll show you a couple of fluctuations in the styles in which she is being depicted. Um, and it's worth noting that history is not like you turn the page and it's different. These are multiple strands happening in different communities with different agendas. And so you will note that you're seeing two potentially contradictory images of Mary around the same time. And this is normal, right? This is because people are producing art to reflect their own values. So why were these women privileged to be the first witnesses to the resurrection? One of the most famous late 11th, early 12th century theologians, philosophers, lovers, Peter Abelard says in a letter to his most beloved Eloise, from the gospels, we infer that these holy women were, so to speak, female apostles set over the apostles so that the apostles might first learn through them what they would later preach themselves to the whole world. So Abelard is setting up this idea of sort of super apostles, that they are the ones who are tasked with doing that first sort of relay of the message, which is then carried out throughout the world. And the reason that these women were given this privilege is because they acted on Jesus's message while the male disciples doubted and fled the women were steadfast. He says, the men slept while the women watched, that is at the cross. They showed by their deeds that they loved him living and dead. Women followed the body and were therefore given the honor of announcing the resurrection to the disciples. Women were as apostles to the apostles. And this is a term that gets applied to Mary Magdalene, apostola apostolorum, literally the, the apostle to the other apostles, sent by the Lord, so commissioned, and the angels, to announce the resurrection so that the apostles learned first from them what they would afterwards preach to the whole world. And in spite of many of the issues around Abelard's historical persona, um, this I think really encapsulates the crux of the matter. This is exactly what is hinging on the depiction of Mary Magdalene. So this idea of being the apostola apostolorum, the apostle to the apostles, is depicted in this early to mid 12th century manuscript. And as far as I know, this is unique in medieval imagery. And that tells us something very important about its iconography. This is the St. Albans Psalter, two folios that are right next to each other, so that as you open, you would see these two pages next to each other. And on the left-hand side, we see the three women at the empty tomb, right, with the angel sitting in his beautiful Romanesque attire, these gorgeous folds here, compressed in these beautiful archways that are so typical of the Romanesque style. And most likely, this one would be Mary Magdalene because we see her immediately next in her role as apostle to the apostles. And she's holding her little trademark jar of ointment here with these other two women who are a bit startled by the sight of the angel. But then there's an immediacy. On the same page, she goes immediately from seeing the empty tomb to preaching. And she is here in an authoritative position, standing on her own on one side of this column, while all the other disciples are crammed into this little space, all of them looking at her so intently to hear her message from Christ directly, and she is standing in the position of speaking to students. This is a teaching hand. And so visually, in every way, this manuscript puts forth the idea that Mary Magdalene's primary identity is to be this witness to the resurrection and preacher to these later apostles. It's very interesting also that the owner of this manuscript for a time at the, uh, at the Abbey of St. Albans was Christina of Marquette. And Christina of Marquette was a um, early 12th century um, anchoress. So she was encased in a small room for much of her, a portion of her life where she could just pray and focus and meditate, um, sort of like the hermit's life, but enclosed. And she was also a prioress of a community of women at St. Albans. And over time, she became quite close with the abbot, Geoffrey. And this is about the mid 12th century. So there's a little bit of confusion still as to who commissioned this text and who, uh, who it was intended for, whether or not it was originally intended for Christina. But the friendship between Abbot Geoffrey and Christina was such that Christina served as his spiritual advisor. And in many ways, she played a role towards Jeffrey that Mary Magdalene played toward the male disciples. So there may be some deeper significance to the depiction of Mary Magdalene in this text versus all other books of ours and prayer books that we have where we do not see this kind of image. And I'll just note this just stunning little repetitious detail in these Romanesque, Romanesque uh, illuminations. 
So, Pope Gregory, with, I'm assuming many of you are well familiar with his homilies, um, preached in 591. Pope Gregory is one of the, let's say, leading uh, churchmen who conflated Mary Magdalene, changed her image, and led to generations and generations of church scholars to go off on these other directions away from that original scriptural role that we've seen already. So in this homily 25, Pope Gregory the Great says, Mary Magdalene went to announce to the disciples that she had seen the Lord and told them these things. Behold, the fault of the human race is destroyed in the very source from which it was taken, that is, a woman. Since in heaven it is a woman who has poured out to man the poison of death, it is also a woman who, coming from the tomb, announces life to men. The Lord tells the human race, from the hand that handed you the drink of death, yes, from the same hand, receive the cup of life. So in this section of the homily, Pope Gregory is actually making Mary Magdalene and Eve two sides of the same coin, much in the way that Eve and the Virgin Mary wind up playing opposite roles to each other, opposite but complementary. And so if Eve in the Garden of Eden has led mankind astray and promised death and basically ruined everything, then here Mary Magdalene is coming to, with her voice, repair the damage that Eve has done. Now the problem is not necessarily in this immediate passage, but the comparison between Mary and Eve does become quite pernicious over time. The more Eve gets blamed for that original sin, for that first crime, and for that first betrayal of uh, obedience to God. And we'll see this play out um, throughout the rest of the lecture. So Mary's iconographic image that she's always depicted with is this little jar of ointment. And the problem with this is that because the ointment appears in several portions of the Gospels, the characters that are also anointing Jesus by virtue of this ointment uh, wind up coming, wind up sort of um, reinforcing the conflation of Mary with other characters in the Bible. So on the one hand, we have Mary herself who is anointing Jesus' dead body. We have an unnamed woman in Bethany who comes and uh, washes, sorry, uh, anoints Jesus' feet. We have Mary of Bethany who is prophetically anointing his feet for burial. And we have Luke's sinner from the city who comes in and weeps all over Jesus' feet and dries them with her hair. So all of these characters, which are later joined together by a subsequent homily by Gregory, are reinforced by this visual uh, presence of the ointment jar. And so it's also just doing damage by the fact that it is attached to her as her symbol. And medieval people who are by and large illiterate in this period are looking for these symbols to read them to be able to identify the saints and the holy figures who are present. So here we have St. Catherine with her wheel. Everybody knows that St. Catherine, every time you see this ointment, Mary. However, a legend that sprung up in the ninth century and was eventually recorded in the Golden Legend by 1260, which is a huge compendium of all of these saints' lives, and it's comp compiled by uh, Jacob of Voragine. And just to tell you what a bestseller this collection of saints' lives was, we have over 1,000 extant manuscripts today of the Golden Legend, which is mind-boggling for a medieval text. So it's so widespread and so beloved. And in the Golden Legend, we have one version of the life of St. Mary, which had been an oral legend and was finally compiled with these other saints. And I'll just give you a brief summary of the first half of it so that we can appreciate these images of Mary preaching. So after the death of Jesus, Mary um, and her brother Lazarus and her sister Martha, um, because the Golden Legend is again conflating her with Mary of Bethany, they all get in a rudderless boat and they're sent out into the Mediterranean with a number of other companions, and they wash ashore in Marseille in southern France, which, if you had to go somewhere, is not a, not a, great, not a bad place. It's a beautiful wine country. Um, and so when they wash ashore there, Mary, with her disciples, as the text says, gets out of the boat and begins to preach to all of those who are worshiping pagan idols in Marseille. And she pe preaches to a prince and his family, this is the coterie that you see here on the left. And as a result, she converts them after performing a miracle, uh, enabling the princess to get pregnant. And interestingly, over the course of the golden legend, she has three infant related miracles. So she's really being depicted as this kind of motherly figure. So in these images, Mary is actually preaching. And these images show us such an 
authentic, licensed preaching. In both, she is physically above everybody else around her, right? She has stature that sets her above hierarchically. She's preaching to people who are evidently of high class and nobility, right? So not only do we have this imaginary royalty in Marseille, but we have all of these courtiers. And then here on this side, in the early 16th century, uh, Netherlandish painting here, just the most sumptuous fabrics and velvets. And you can really tell that these people are of a notable class. And so the fact that you have this woman preaching to them reflects back on her license to preach and her authority to preach. In addition, she's depicted here literally in a pulpit, right? How much more official can you get? How much more sanctioned preaching can you do? So Mary Magdalene definitely carries the role of preacher as a result of not only the original scriptural sections, but also the golden legend, which trust me does plenty of other damage, but this is one of the positive outcomes of it. And to come to the famous homily uh, preached in September 592, this is the section where we have the conflation of Mary Magdalene with the other women and the subversion of her identity to Luke's sinner. So in this homily, Pope Gregory says, the one that Luke calls a sinner, namely the sinner from the city who comes to uh, wipe Jesus' feet with her hair and weep all over them, and that John names Mary, we believe that she is that Mary of whom, according to Mark, the Lord has cast out seven demons. And what are these seven demons, if not the universality of all vices? Since seven days suffice to embrace the whole of time, the number seven rightly represents universality. Mary had seven demons in her, for she was full of all vices. So these original seven demons with which Mary Magdalene was beset were intended, in many scholars' opinion, to not show a negative side of Mary, right? She herself is not full of sin in the original biblical version. She is being beset externally by demons. And the purpose of the story is to show Jesus's healing power, not to denigrate Mary. And in this sermon, by conflating seven demons with seven deadly sins, Pope Gregory does perhaps the biggest disservice to her memory. And this idea that seven days is a complete time, it's universality is of course coming from Genesis, right? All the world is created in seven days, it is all time. And then to quote from the text which he's reading, uh, she brought an alabaster vase full of perfume and standing behind Jesus at her feet, she began to water them with her tears and to wipe them with the hair of her head. And they kissed them and sprinkled them per with perfume. It is very evident, my brethren, that this woman, formerly addicted to forbidden deeds, had used perfume to give her flesh a pleasant odor. She had emphasized the beauty of her hair to adorn her face, but now she was using it to wipe away her tears. So bring back the eyes of your mind on you, dear brothers, yes, on you, and propose to imitate the example of this penitent sinner. Just a couple of points. First, Luke does not say that in any way was this sinner a sexual deviant, a prostitute, anything sexualized. But such is the tradition inherited from the ancient world, from the Greeks and the Romans, uh, and the early, the early Christian world as well, through the story of Eve, that sensuality and sexuality is at the root of female sin. The body is fundamentally weaker than a man's body. And this idea is taken from Aristotelian logic. Aristotle actually says that a woman is to a man as a slave is to a master. And he describes the female body as being an imperfect version of the male. So from the very beginning, and then as you sprinkle in some of the early Greek medical ideas about how the female body is prone to irrationality and prone to changeability, making her unable to hold government position, to preach. Um, all of these ideas together wind up resulting in this tremendously denigrating view of the female body and its ineffable link to sexuality. There's no other kind of sin besides perhaps gossip that women are traditionally associated with. And so by taking the idea of her hair which in the early period is a symbol of sensuality, especially if it's big, loose, golden, unbridled hair, right? Representing passion and, and loose morals. If she's taking that hair and converting it into something that is helping with her penance, she takes the perfume that she would have anointed her body to be appealing to suitors, presumably, into something that is penance, into an action of penance, rather, then she is converting her sinful physicality into this model of the penitent sinner. 
And at the end, Gregory is so pointed. This is an example that we should follow. And so everything else that Mary Magdalene is or has been is now subsumed under this vice-filled sexual sinner. The second part of the golden legend involves Mary Magdalene pushing back against the sexuality, pushing back against all kinds of um, bodily appetites and, and pleasures of the earth. And she goes into the desert as a, re as a recluse. Um, this is outside of Marseille, outside of Aix rather, in, in an area called Les Bommes. And she lives for 30 years in the wilderness. And her hair grows long. And so this hair that had been a symbol of female sexuality now becomes her modest clothing for the sinful body. And we start to see a lot of depictions of Mary being levitated by the angels who every day on the canonical hours would bring her up so that she could eat heavenly food and not have any need of physical food. So again, the true denunciation of the female body. She doesn't even need to eat to feed it. She is pushing it down, enabling her spirit to rise closer to God by rejecting the physical. And so here we have three images, um, increasingly dramatic almost. And the Donatello image that you see here is almost devoid of all female characteristics, right? She looks rather androgynous. She looks gaunt. She looks haunted by the fact that she has been living in the wilderness in constant penance, just constantly repenting for the sexual sins that drove her there. And so this is another example of sort of the hair converting as Mary Magdalene's role is converting. But you would be wrong if you thought that this was the only Mary who was ever depicted covered with hair. And so this is another factor, just like the alabaster jar, that sort of reinforces these, mo these models of Mary Magdalene, sort of pushing her towards this composite figure when in fact we should be peeling these pieces back. What you see here is an image of Mary Magdalene all the way on the left, right? She has her alabaster jar. She is veiled as in the earliest models of images of Mary. And here we have another Mary fully coated with hair. I read an article where they called her the Hairy Mary. And this is Mary of Egypt. And St. Mary of Egypt is uh, a fourth century um, eremitical woman. She goes out into the desert just like Mary Magdalene um, and finds her salvation there. But before that, she is a prostitute who not only pays her way to Jerusalem to go see those sites there using sexual favors, but also enjoying them. And so she's that character that is not only pushed into a life of sin, but seeks it out. And so the more we focus on the life of St. Mary of Egypt, the more that then reflects back onto the life of Mary of Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, sorry. And so this sensuality becomes a, a seminal aspect of her identity. And again, in homily 25, Pope Gregory the Great says, Mary, the one we are talking about, may here appear as a witness of the divine mercy. What we see in this, my brethren, we must, sorry, what must we see except the immense mercy of our creator who gives us as an example of penance, so again, that same model that we're supposed to imitate, those whom he has revived through penance after their fall. I cast my eyes on Peter. I consider the thief. I examine Zacchaeus, a tax collector from Jericho. I look at Mary, and I see everywhere only examples of hope and penance exposed to our eyes. Look at Mary, you who, consumed by the fire of an evil desire, have lost the purity of the flesh. She has burned carnal love in her with the fire of divine love. And so instead of the witness of the resurrection, the first apostle, we have this example of Mary who is dependent on God's mercy. And so instead of being a story about Mary seeking out God, it's a story of divine mercy, which means that she does not necessarily ever get over the sins that she has committed. And so here on the left, we have Mary of Egypt again. Here on the right, Mary Magdalene. And in both of the stories, we have a male cleric coming to these women in the wilderness, stumbling upon them sometimes. Mary Magdalene living in a cave, as you can see on the right, covered with a scarlet hair. Um, I'll leave the red hair to, for you to discern. Um, and in both cases, male clerics come to them and give them clothes to cover their sinful bodies. So you can really see how the life of St. Mary of Egypt is now impinging on the life of Mary Magdalene. So one more portion of the story that often gets depicted, and I think this might be one of the most um, perilous to Mary Magdalene's identity, um, except for the 
repentant prostitute, of course, but there are several negative depictions of this. This is the Noli Me Tangera. So the Noli Me Tangera is the scene in the Gospel of John, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, where Jesus says, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended to the Father. And the problem with the Latin translation from the Vulgate, which is the Latin Bible, of Noli Me Tangera, is that Latin is a much smaller language than Greek. It has a much more straight-laced vocabulary where one word will serve to mean many things. And what this does is it strips the word touch of all of the nuance that the original Greek has. And so by saying noli me tangra, it sounds quite aggressive, don't touch me. And so you start to get the sense that Mary is not worth, she's not worthy to touch Jesus, again, reflecting on the sinfulness of her female body. And in this image, it's mixed, right? We have Mary and Jesus kind of both at the same level. They're not necessarily subordinated one to the other. They're both dressed in these beautifully decorated Romanesque ivory carved folds with um, beautiful um, hems. And yes, Mary is wearing a halo. Jesus is reaching out as well as sort of scooting away from her with one foot heading out the door. And yet his hand is in the traditional image of blessing. So he's not pushing her away, resisting her touch. He's still in the process of blessing her. And I know one of the agendas of Reclaim Magdalene is to address some of the errors in the way that these art objects are portrayed in museums and in private collections. And so the fact that this one is called the Noli Me Tangra, when you look at the Latin up here, this translates to Dominus Loquitur Mariae, God or the Lord speaks to Mary. So this, although it's depicting the Noli Me Tangra, what is more important is that Jesus addresses Mary the resurrected Christ is in conversation with her. And I think that that is a nuance that should appear somewhere in the caption for this object. We have another Noli Me Tangra, which is a tapestry um, from around 1500 in the Netherlands. And this too is showing an image that is depicted as being somewhat aggressive in the actual caption for this, which is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The caption says, Christ raises his right hand, commanding Mary to keep her distance. Is that what you say? Again, we're not seeing the specific blessing pose, but this is a gentle hand. This is a hand that is aimed towards her head as though giving a prayer, giving a blessing to her. And so you see the kind of complicated way that the captions often work against what the image is, really inflecting how you as an audience member, as a viewer, are going to interact with this piece. And all around in this tapestry, we have um, botanical symbolism that is so typical of medieval tapestries. And I just wanted to point out two that kind of help us understand what we're seeing. On the left-hand side, we have the images of poppies, which appear behind Mary. And because of the sort of soporific qualities of the poppy, the poppy represents sleep and then even death. So we're definitely aware that we're in an immediately post-resurrection scene here where Christ has died. Um, but the poppy is also the flower, historically speaking, of the goddess Venus, goddess of love and beauty. So we have a little bit of a tension there. On the right, we have the lilies of the valley. And the lilies of the valley, although present in the Old Testament book, The Song of Songs, which Mary Magdalene is occasionally equated to the bride in that, in that, in that book, um, the lily of the valley also represents the Virgin Mary's tears at the crucifixion and also Eve's tears at being exiled from Eden. So there's a lot of layered symbolism here that helps us to understand what we're seeing. And it's not as simple as Jesus rejecting Mary here. The Noli Me Tangra then takes on a more aggressive form in public spaces. And this is something that I think is really worth exploring by scholars. Um, what you see here are two chapel paintings. You have an altar on the right, and then in the Scrivani Chapel in Padua, a big fresco by Giotto or by his, um, his school. And in both of these, the Noli Me Tangra feels much harsher than the earlier ones that I just showed you, right? Jesus is using the flat of his hand to push back against Mary. And the hierarchy is so evident. Jesus is looking down at her in every way. So these depictions then reinforce that sense that Mary is not worth touching Jesus. Her body has, has turned her so sinful that she is not worthy of touching the hem of his clothing. And here she is depicted in red. And in the Middle Ages, red was a symbol of charity. It was not necessarily a symbol of passion or arduous love or romance or anything like that. It is a symbol of caritas, good love, love, um, selfless love. So between these two versions, which would be in public, where people would go to chapel and see them, where you would go up to the altar and see them, they're broadcast in your face, likely commissioned by the upper class, by the church itself. These contrast deeply 
with the more private devotional objects of Mary Magdalene. And here you have two more Noli Me Tangeras, but these are much softer. These are much more gentle in a way. So on the left, you have a late 12th century image um, from a book that's actually just a compilation of illuminations at this point. They've been cut out from their main uh, prayer book and sort of stitched together so you can just flip through the, the images. Um, and you can see by the complementing colors between what Jesus is wearing and what Mary Magdalene is wearing that they're meant to be understood as a pair. It's not a hierarchy one to the other, even though he is slightly bigger um, and he is looking down at her, they are sharing eye contact. And I think this is really important about the intimacy of this moment. This is not Jesus rejecting Mary. This is an obvious blessing. And then likewise, on the right-hand side, in the early 16th century, uh, the Ponche hours at the Getty, again, Mary Magdalene is anything but abject. Like she was crawling on her hands and knees in the previous image. She's dressed like a queen. She has a beautiful golden halo. Her long golden hair is straight, is draped all over the sumptuous robe that she's wearing. Jesus, triumphant, dressed in gold, giving an obvious blessing and looking down at this woman that he loved. It's also important to note in medieval, oops, in medieval um, placement of miniatures and illuminations that where they are in the book and what text they're next to and the order in which they appear is a second way of reading a medieval manuscript. There's often a funny play going on between the images and the words. So here, this image of the Noli Me Tangra is not the only image of Mary in this Psalter. We have one beforehand, and we can presume that this is her because she's again in blue, and she's actually blessing the empty tomb here. So she has an authoritative role again, and it's not only the witness of the resurrection, but also this first at the scene kind of um, role that she's playing, this privileged role with these other two women. And the angel looks pretty pleased with himself, I think, in that one. And then likewise, um, in the Ponche Hours, we have three images of Mary Magdalene. And just keep in mind that these are done by different artists in the same codex. So we have Mary Magdalene in Anole Me Tangra here, where she and Jesus are at eye level with each other. He has sort of an open palm showing her the wound. In no way is he pushing, right? He's sort of just indicating. Um, she has her classic little ointment jar there. Then the scene I just showed you. And then here she is with the Virgin Mary. And again, there's a sort of parallelism going on between the way Mary Magdalene is dressed and the way the Virgin Mary is dressed. Slightly different because of course we have to have that classic pink and blue for the Virgin Mary, but their necklines are the same, their physiognomy is the same, their hair is the same, and their crowns are almost the same. So in a sense, these two women are being depicted on the same level. So this, these devotional private objects, and this one is especially important because it belonged, oh sorry, no. Nope, that's the next one. Um, so these devotional objects, which would be used for private use, show a very different kind of Noli Me Tangra than the ones that are in public spaces. Then of course we move on to the repentant prostitute. Here we have Mary Magdalene in the wilderness. So this is from the Provencal legend, right? She's out in the wilderness for 30 years and we can see that up here, she's being levitated hourly by the angels to be fed from this little hand of God that's blessing out of the sky here. But she is shown in a completely different demeanor. She is weeping over the crucifix, repentant till the end of days, and focusing on this, his, this uh, artistic motif known as a memento mori. This is a reminder that you will die. And so by focusing on this, she is aware of the, of the scales of justice and the sins that she's committed in her life and the repentance that's necessary to even those scales out, right? She is constantly meditating on this and never fully forgiven. Right? She is always in a state of penance. And again, of course, the uh, physicality of her nudity is going to be an increasing factor over the early modern period. What's interesting especially about this, and this is um, actually a miniature by one of the most famous miniaturists, Simon Benning, like the last great miniaturist. Um, and this was actually in a prayer book for an abbess. And what's interesting about that is this does not strike me necessarily as being typical for a female audience if we compare it to the Psalter that was owned by Christina of Marquette, very, very different depictions. And yes, time has passed, but also the, the kind of audience has not necessarily passed, right? We're still dealing with women who are in positions of authority in monasteries. So it's a very interesting change that only becomes truly magnified. Um, and here, of course, we have the famous Titian painting of Mary Magdalene where she's got that curly blonde hair that is suggestive of her loose morals, right, of her sensuality. And 
she does not seem to get the point of covering herself with it, right? So we're, of course, dealing with this very voyeuristic, sexualized woman, which, frankly, if she didn't have her little, um, her little jar of ointment in the corner here, we would not be able to confirm that this was a portrait of Mary Magdalene. So Titian has just provided us with this sort of throwaway iconographic nod. And she's in this dark, cloudy background as though lost in turmoil, this searching constantly for clarity and peace. So again, this always penitent woman who's been deeply, deeply sexualized. Um, and then here on the right by Dirk Blaker in the mid 17th century, we can see the Mary Magdalene in the cave, right? There's just this little slit to see the outside world. So again, she's in this sort of tenebrous, evil space that is just dark and pulling at her soul, worshiping this crucifix or venerating this crucifix here in her hand, turned at an angle. And again, you know, undressed in a way that is titillating to the audience, but not at all related to Mary's original role. And her eyes are full of tears and she is just in absolute abject misery here, atoning. So although the Vatican has acknowledged that um, Mary Magdalene is not this composite figure introduced or really promulgated by Pope Gregory the Great, and although her feast was elevated uh, from, mem from a memorial to a feast in 2016, um, Yet this popular image of her as this physical, uh, sexual slave almost continues to exist. And it exists not only in our popular memory, but all over the walls too of museums. And it is not only our historical obligation, but our scriptural obligation to restore her authority and centrality as an apostle, as a witness, and as an authentic herald of the resurrection. Thank you. Are there questions? Oh, sorry, Russ, are you? Yeah, so thank you, uh, Dr. Axon. That was just, <clears throat> I hate to use a pun, but that was very illuminating um, and, and <laughs> very, um, a very um, wonderful way to trace um, all of that art through history. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, just sort of walk through how we're going to do the Q&A. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, what we're asking you to do is to unmute yourself, and I'll give you that ability to the ability to do that in just a second. Uh, to unmute yourself, but hold your question until I call on you. Um, that'll just help keep down on uh, confusion and also background noise. Once you've asked your question, if you could um, mute in, in any follow-up you might want to ask, if you could just mute yourself, that would be great. Alternatively, if you do know how and where to find the raise your hand feature in Zoom, um, you can also do that. Uh, but I'll, I'll keep an eye on folks' names as they unmute themselves. So I'm giving, that, um, giving you that ability. I do see that Julie, you've asked a question or you would like to ask a question. Uh, yes, I just wanted to go back to the Latin translation of do not touch me. I know you mentioned um, <clears throat> the, uh, that they didn't have the nuance of the Greek translation, but I didn't remember you saying what the Greek, potential Greek translations were. You didn't? Okay, good. <laughs> Could you? Uh, sure. Uh, I don't speak Greek, so I didn't want to go through the process of trying to pronounce it incorrectly for you, but essentially, okay. sorry about that. The you Greek, know more than we do, so go ahead. <laughs> the translation would be something more like, don't cling to me, don't hold to me, don't keep me here, and not don't touch me physically, right? So it has a, a much more symbolic and a broader series of meanings that are much more sort of, um, what's the opposite of literal? Um, I'm blanking now. Uh, they're, they're more, they're looser, they're more... Um, what you get for talking straight for a half hour. Um, metaphorical. Sorry? Metaphorical. Sure, okay. Right, so it's not necessarily about don't physically touch right. Christ's body, which is resurrected, but he is still in the process of ascending to the Father, and therefore his, his mission is not complete yet, so don't hold him here on earth out of love or out of you know, need mm -hmm. or anything like that. So I think it's, it's not intended in the Greek from my understanding um, to be a, you know, don't touch me kind of, don't physically touch me. I think it's a more of a don't, don't keep me to linger here. 
so that's important if you were really engaging the uh, the museums or whatever to change the description or uh, explanation of what you're seeing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. It, it just slipped my mind to say it in the moment I got carried away, but thank you so much for bringing that up. Absolutely important. Yeah, and I, and I would just add to that, um, that the scriptural ev evidence is, in, you know, immediately after that, Jesus sends her uh, to go tell the apostles um, what, what he's or including, I'm going before you. Um, you know, so follow me. So it's, so it, you know, um, how, Jesus obviously wants their presence, um, uh, but it's this don't cling, don't hold me back, don't keep me from going where I need to go, and don't hold on to yourself too. So I'll just put that out there. Um, I do see that Joe, Joe Rogers, you would like to ask a question. I thank you, Dr. Axon. Um, I'm curious, I was, I've never seen that image before of um, Mary in the pulpit preaching. That was so striking. And I'm just curious, what was the, with the official church's response to, during that time, to an image that's so, str like, how could they continue to deny the role of women when you clearly have that image of a preaching woman. I'm just curious what the institutional reaction was at the time to an image like that. So my understanding is that many theologians thought that Mary Magdalene was an exception because she was commissioned directly by Jesus and that because she was able to preach does not mean that women may preach. And then over the course of the Middle Ages, you have a slew of um, different sort of stereotypes and uh, repressions of women's speech in general, right? The sin of gossip is a female sin. And I think that also just compounds it. But um, if I don't know, if Rita, if you want to add to that, but my understanding was that there were several early theologians who believed her to be a special case. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, also, I would just add, Susan Haskins points out that um, the image of her preaching is, she's preaching about penitence. Um, there was an image that we just didn't have time to show that's a transitional image of her where she's uh, covered in her hair and then there's vignettes around it. It's called the Magdalene Masterpiece. And, on the, and she has a scroll that says, if you repent like me, you'll find salvation. And the idea is, especially during the Golden Legend, is that she's preaching about penance. So it's the Middle Ages were able to keep this sort of balance of I mean, inaccurate, but still a balance of her as a woman with authority, but the authority to preach about penance because you must never forget that women are sinners. So it was, and then it's later when the, the Titian will, sh and there's many, there's a couple of others that will start, and especially after the Council of Trent, um, that model, uh, she's just a penitent, she's just a sinner. But earlier, pre-Council of Trent, we have this some beautiful images of her preaching, but it's about penance. She's not, so. I would also add actually, Rita, if that's a depiction of the golden legend and her job is to preach against idolatry. Oh, right. Um, there's that's a okay. sort of um, mm -hmm. almost historicization of that scene where like that was when she proselytized Provence, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's not advocating necessarily for women to continue to preach necessarily even Perhaps it is about penance, but perhaps it's also this sort of turn away from idolatry, which who is going to argue with that, right, in the early church, right? They're all about missionary and proselytization. So I think that those two things go side by side. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, I see um, Joanna, uh, Joanne Flora. It looks like you were next. You had a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't have a question, but I would like to suggest that uh, another image that I saw about six years ago in a beautiful church in Paris, the Church of Saint Savarin, which is a 14th century church. And there is a magnificent stained glass window in that church of Mary Magdalene preaching to the people of Provence. And uh, it, when I saw it, it just, blew me away. I had never seen anything like that before. And you might want to take a look at it if you have if you don't know about it already. I have it in front of me. It doesn't look medieval to me. It looks later. No, I think it probably is later because the, the church was destroyed, I think, by fire and rebuilt a couple of times. And I think this is a later depiction. I don't think it goes back to the 14th century. But it is beautiful, isn't it? Oh, it's gorgeous, yeah. And she is, 
such a commanding figure in the midst of all of the people surrounding her, both ordinary peasant type folks and also noble folks. And then in the background, there is the ship that they, or the boat that they arrived in with a beautiful flag with the cross. So it's really lovely if, if other participants would like to take a look at. It's Saint Savarin Church in Paris in the, in the Latin Quarter. Thank you so much for that. Um, it looks to me like it's a 19th century window and it reminds me actually of a huge um, group of images of Joan of Arc in the Orléans Cathedral. Like it looks, a very, it's a very similar style of these heroic women sort of in the midst of these crowds doing their preaching thing that they were doing, you know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, Christine Schenk, Sister Chris. Yes. So I think you had a question. I did. and. Um, I just, and I know this isn't the topic tonight, but I do want to recall that in the Eastern Church, Mary Magdala did not ever get the repentant prostitute, but was always honored as the apostle to the apostles. And I just wonder if you knew of any art, how that developed in, in a trajectory in the East. Mm. And I could say, thank you, this is fabulous. <laughs> um, no, I don't have a specific trend to think of. I know that they, that she was never conflated with Mary of Bethany because they retained their separate feast days. Um, but I don't know what kind of iconography there is in the East. Uh, I'll pass it to Rita if you're familiar with any pieces of art. Not really, but then. Yeah, no, I, I just know some, you know, flat, you know, front facing Mary Magdalene's with a, with a jar of ointment. Um, but it's interesting that there aren't images of her preaching um, yes, but she was never conflated um, with, as the sinner. Right, the vast majority of images of Mary Magdalene are those kind of static, two-dimensional, uh, you know, and in the East, they're more of the, the relic style, they're not the relic style, the icon style, um, but in the West as well, you have these tableau that are in altar pieces that are just saint after saint after saint after saint, and so most of the images of Mary Magdalene are just kind of her standing there holding her ointment and not acting in anything. So I think these are really unique. And it was quite difficult actually to find enough pieces. I mean, there are a couple that we didn't, we didn't show, but by and large, she's not doing the things we want her to do in the art, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a couple more questions I think we have time for. Is that okay, Dr. Axon? Okay. Uh, Kathy and uh, I think it's probably just Kathy Kidder. Yes, I'm wondering if any of the images show her as um, less um, European. Are there, uh, that would, I suppose, be in the later era because some of the early ones are in wood or stone. But um, it, it, are there, is there any uh, art in that vein? That shows it's her. More Mediterranean looking woman. Not that I know of, there are some depictions of Mary of Egypt where she looks more appropriate for where she's from. Um, but nothing springs to mind about Mary Magdalene except for, of course, the, uh, the work that they did with the relics um, that recreated her face structure recently. Um, so in that, she looked quite Semitic in that. And they did all kinds of tests on the hair that was in the reliquary. Um, so, other than that modern piece, I can't think of anything that, that celebrates her origins, but this is a problem, of course, that we have with most of the biblical figures, right? All right, and um, Katerina Lindman, you had a question? Yes, I noticed in the, um, the picture with Mary Magdalene at the pulpit, it looked like she was kneeling. And do you think she's kneeling? And does that sort of fit in with this, she's a penitent uh, preacher, preaching about penitence? Um, you know, with things like this, it's kind of a toss up as to whether, whether the artist um, has made a choice to depict something in a certain way, namely not necessarily anatomically correct, right? Which is a case that we have often when characters are all different sizes in medieval art. But mm -hmm. I don't know, it does look like it, but you don't see her feet. So I wouldn't 
know if it was intended that way or not. Um, it is a panel painting and an altar piece, so it, it is kind of constricted. And sometimes in medieval art, you just you see things that are weird because they're dealing with a certain space. But if anybody else thinks that um, thinks something else, I I would be happy to be convinced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me it was a toss up. I was like, is she is she kneeling or is she standing? And then when someone said um, about her teaching penance, I thought, well, maybe she is kneeling and it is symbolizing that. Possibly. It's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I may go back to the golden legend and see if there's anything specific. Um, somebody in the chat asked about a reliquary, Russ. No, but I, I wanted to ask about um, the original, some of the original images you showed and you say they depicted Mary Magdalene. How did you know that? Um, it was hard for me to be able to discern necessarily in some of those first couple that the woman depicted was Mary Magdalene. Well, in the scenes of them, these are the women who are going to the tomb and Mary was one of them. So I don't know which of the three is Mary Magdalene. The only reason that I suggested one of them was the woman at the tomb was the Mary Magdalene and this is in the St. Albans Psalter is because she's dressed identically and that's a, that's a visual cue by the illustrator to let us know that it's the same character. Um, and then later on, there's a scene where the first woman there holding the ointment is dressed in blue and then Mary Magdalene right. is in brown. So I'm just suggesting based on the way the artist is portraying it, I'm not saying that that's 100% necessarily Mary Magdalene, but at this point she is going to be perhaps the most famous. I mean, she has a cult growing. She, she's the patroness of so many things, of lepers of all different um, religious groups and flagellant groups and the Franciscans are you know enamored with her so I would say that she's by this point by the late middle ages the most famous of those three women but, but even on, on the on the wooden panel I think that was the very first one you showed oh in Santa Sabina yes right it's just it's Christ blessing the women who had seen him at the tomb which is uh is two panels up as the women at the tomb so okay. it's, just a, it's just a parallel image of the same characters Okay. Um, can I? Oh, the reliquary. Sorry. So, can I just touch on that quickly? Mm -hmm. So, there there are reliquaries um, purportedly holding relics of Mary Magdalene. There's a whole story, um, but this is one that was um, in a church in Provence, where in the 13th century. Um, one of the kings of Naples discovered these tombs and the tomb that he discovered was underneath the tomb of Bishop Maximin, who is the one who takes the boat with Mary and he's the one who buries her and gives her her last Eucharist when she comes out of the wilderness in the Provencal legend. And um, they put the remains that were in there in a reliquary and then the last couple of years, I believe in 2017, they subjected it to all kinds of analysis and they built out a face based on the bone structure, based on what they know about pore size and you know, um, little, uh, like the lip, lip with, uh, lip with thickness, I don't know, all of that, of a woman of 50-ish years of Semitic descent, and they actually did um, some DNA testing of the hair and the bones, and found that the woman was consistent with a haplogroup that is very common among Semitic populations. So, there's also a reliquary even in the Met, um, I don't know if it's a Met or the Cloisters, that purportedly had a tooth of Mary Magdalene's, I believe it's a big tall thing. So there are false relics all over the place from the Middle Ages, um, and I am not qualified to say whether the ones found in Provence were false or not, but uh, it's a way of drawing economic traffic and pilgrims to, mo to monasteries and churches and basilicas. Um, could I answer, uh, somebody put it in the chat, there are two things in the chat I'd like to um, like reflect on. Um, let me make sure I have the first one. So who is to blame for Mary's downfall in history? Uh, the answers, well, uh, from the reading I've done, and Chris Shank can add to this, and so could Christine and uh, other scholars. But yes, Gregory started it. He wasn't the first to suggest that she could be somebody else. She could have been blended. You know, um, Augustine and Jerome, they, they contemplated. But no one uh, put all three women together, Mary of Bethany, the sinful woman, and Mary Magdalene. Um, and, uh, but there was plenty before that, Ambrose, Augustine, they were, they were very much into, you know, just what Christine said about uh, the female body, the, the Aristotelian image of the female body. So they ignore Jesus' uh, inclusion of women in his most intimate circle, 
his his commissioning of women, trusting them with the most innate, most important message, resurrection. So they these men, these church fathers, ignore that information, and they go with Aristotle's view of women as the and and they they bring it to another level by making your salvation um, depend on you being celibate and therefore women are a problem. So you, you get before Gregory, you're, you have a lot of antipathy building, 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 and it's women's fault. And it's all because women exist in their bodies. I don't know where else we're supposed to exist, but that's, that's part of it. So Gregory brings that, his abbey, they studied Augustine at his abbey. So he brings that information up into the sixth century, which was a mess full of corruption. And he needs somebody and, and he preaches about penance and he, he includes other sinners, not just Mary Magdalene, but the big focus is Mary Magdalene. But then as Christine illustrated, the golden legend really took it to the, the next level. And um, the golden legend was emerged from, you know, a beads, uh, beads, uh, uh, what do you call that? Analysis of Luke's gospel, which basically he used Gregory's analysis of Luke seven, 36 of the penitent woman. And then, um, and then that was uh, Odo Clooney you know, expanded on that and began a little bit of the legend. And then by the 11th century, there was so much interest in her and there were shrines to her and you could really make money. And in Vézelé, where um, they claimed, all of a sudden they claimed to have her body. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course there was the legend of her being uh, cast, cast off from the, uh, the Mediterranean, the coast of Israel, and landing miraculously in southern France. So, so it was really money, and there, there could be a whole interesting lecture on how the church has made money off of Mary Magdalene, um, which I wouldn't go into now. So it's a combination. It starts with Gregory, but he was influenced by people before him, and it's expanded um, into a money-making proposition um, with the multiple shrines, most especially Vesele and then Baum, where the her her hermitage was supposed to be. And they, it just went on and went on and it was a very useful. So that's another topic. How useful was it to remove this challenging image of a woman of authority um, in the midst of a, a Roman empire based hierarchy? So that's, that's a short answer for that. I think also part and parcel of it is what are the appetites of people who are performing Christianity at this point. And so Mary is the hermit who is, you know, denigrating her physicality, who is, you know, who is not present on this earth except until she can be freed, um, who is living in the wilderness, who is pursuing something that is separate from urban life, all of this. This is dovetailing really well with a lot of the changes that are happening in lay piety throughout the Middle Ages. And so she becomes increasingly appealing through her image in the Provencal legend to the point where you have people like the Franciscans who are, can now emulate her or, you know, the flagellant groups who pick her up as a patroness. And so this is also, it's, I think the, the error might be to think that the church is imposing a certain thing when sometimes it's the appetite of the people that are driving that. Yes, and so yes. Both things hand in hand, mm -hmm. what's, happening in, what's happening in Christianity at the moment in as much as what authority is saying she is. And so these mm -hmm. two things together are, pro are providing this push forward, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Rita, there was a question about um, the, where is it, the uh, question of whether or not Mary Magdalene was a widow. I don't know anything about that. Um, there, we don't know. I mean, she could be, uh, uh, though it'd be interesting why she wasn't named by, in relation to her husband, her deceased husband. Um, I mean, there is the, the issue that uh, when she's introduced in Luke 8, uh, verse 2, and three, um, it says that uh, she and Joanna and Susanna supported Jesus, or some translations are them, but uh, him or them, out of their, um, T-H-E-I-R, their resources. And there is a, is a feminized um, identifier in that phrase. So it's their money. It's not the common purse. And, um, and it's... Um, and the verb is uh, that they went, you know, they, not that they had been with him, but they were in the process of going about with him. So, um, so if she had money and it, we know that some, in the Roman Empire, some women could have businesses, some of them, depending on if they had somebody who could sign for them. 
I mean, Julia Felix, who Chris Shank made sure we, we, we met in uh, Pompeii. Um, you know, there were women who had businesses and they did have money. And she, if she came from Magdala, um, that was a fairly wealthy town. She could have had an interest in a fishing, you know, soft fishing or something. Um, and she could have easily been a widow. Uh, but, but there's no way to know for sure because her name doesn't indicate that, which is one of her amazingly unique things. Don't forget, Joanna is identified as the wife of Huzza, uh, Herod Steward. And then Salome is just off on her own. We don't know if there's other Salomes. But it's Mary the Magdalene. And that name is consistent across the canonical and the non-canonical texts that were written over a span of around 300 years for a wide range of geographically dispersed people. So her name is solid, you know, and it's Mary the Magdalene, which could be from Magdala or it could be an attribute, you know, um, a fortress or towering. There's different, scholars are debating that. Um, so we, we, there's no way to know, but we do know is that she was generous, faithful. You know, there's things that we absolutely do know. And we know she stuck with Jesus and there, I mean, there could be another presentation and all the places where she is in the, in the text, but she's not named. It's, uh, Carla Ricci has done fantastic, and Barbara Reed did a great lecture on that, also at Boston College, uh, the Barbara Reed lecture, I highly recommend. Um, that's R-E-I-D. Also, the, um, it's worth noting that women who were widows were labeled as such in the early Middle Ages and not by their own names, even though their husband had died. So the amount of charters I've looked at where it's like, so-and-so, wife of the late, blah, blah, or widow of mm -hmm. the late they're still linked to a man if there is one. So I'm not saying that that's 100% true across the board in the first century, but it's something that is pretty typical in the archival record. And yes, I would love to take everyone on a tour of the cloisters when it opens. <laughs> yes, definitely, yes. Great. Uh, well, I, I hate to interrupt us here. It sounds like we could go all night, um, and I'm sure uh, there are a few of us who would enjoy that, but uh, I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Axon, for being with us tonight and for sharing your expertise and preparing that just phenomenal presentation and really great slideshow to accompany it, too. That was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to Rita for helping us put all this together, for all of your work. Um, uh, helping to promote the, the true story of Mary of Magdala. Um, you've done such wonderful things um, for her memory and for women of the church today. That's just incredible. I do want to turn things to Deb um, Rose Milovac, who's co-director of Future Church, for some announcements and a final prayer. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Dr. Axon. This was just fantastic. Um, Thank you, Rita, for all you do. And, you know, Chris is in the, in the audience here. My gosh, thanks to Chris and all the people at Future Church who dreamt up this idea in the first place of honoring Mary Magdala to uh, recover her story, her true story. So we are forever grateful. I'm just reminded very quickly that it wasn't very long ago when there was a group of people, the Legionnaires, who, uh, when I first came on board, I think it was 2016, they were trying to raise funds for their Magdala Center at, on the Sea of Galilee. And in their booklet, they actually compared Mary Magdala to uh, Marcial Marcial. So uh, it was horrible. Future Church started a campaign and they, they, uh, they pulled back from that, which just goes to show the power of this repentant prostitute is still very strong among us, very damaging and can be very lucrative as we can see by the Legionnaire's use of her. So thanks for all that. I just wanna give you a few heads up about all the great things that Future Church is doing. Uh, most of you know, uh, by the way, you'll hear some of this beautiful music in the background. I'm with my grandchildren today. We've got a bit of a family emergency going on, so I'm playing grandma as well. So if you hear that music, you'll know that it's my beautiful grandchildren. Um, we have twice weekly literatures, uh, Wednesday and Sunday evening, uh, which has uh, been a beautiful experience with people. Uh, so join us if you can on August 28th. We have uh, the next uh, installment of our Women Erased series. We have Sister Anita Baird, who is with the Society of the Daughters of the Heart of Mary. 
and uh, she most recently served as their provincial. She was the chief of staff for late uh, Cardinal Francis George, a founding director of the Archdiocese uh, Racial Justice uh, Program. And she's gonna talk about the women who have been erased from our Catholic memory and history who are black Catholic women. Uh, so it'll be a very interesting series. We invite you to join us on the 28th. We're starting a whole new series of uh, focusing on um, the um, uh, wider issues of justice within the Catholic Church. Uh, our Voices That Challenge series is beginning soon. Uh, the first part of that is confronting racism within the church and in the world. And it's gonna be uh, probably a two year project where we're gonna look at the history of black Catholics through the eyes of black Catholic women religious. Uh, the project is under the guidance of Dr. Shannon D. Williams. And it's gonna involve a lot of really great things including resources, gatherings, presentations, original art, and just a whole lot more to bring awareness about the legacy of racism within the Catholic Church, but also how do we advocate for change? How do we advocate for reparations? So there's a, it's a, 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 going to be a, a series of great resources and we look forward to sharing that with you. We'll have our first real presentation in this series on September 15th uh, and it'll be with Dr. Uh, Tia Noel Pratt. She is a sociologist who specializes in systemic racism within the Catholic Church and how that racism impacts African-American Catholic identity. So it'll be very interesting to have her kick off that whole new project for us and we're looking forward to um, lots of good material there. In the fall, we have our fall event, which is gonna change this year, of course, with the pandemic uh, and so forth. Uh, so instead of an in-person uh, event, we're going to have um, virtual events like this and we see how great this can be. We have lots of people joining us. We hope you'll join us for a fall event where we're titled, it's titled uh, Making Sense of 2020 being church today. And uh, so we're commemorating our 30 years of working for reform. Uh, and so the first part of that will happen on October 22nd with uh, Dr. Cecilia Gonzalez Andre, who will be talking about, um, uh, you know, she's gonna take on this topic of, you know, making sense of what's been going on this past year in the Catholic church in terms of, you know, all the various issues that we're facing, especially as people of color, as people, women who are trying to uh, gain our full uh, acceptance and equality within the Catholic Church. And along with her that night, we're gonna give our Christine Schenk Young Leadership Award to Doris Reisinger. Uh, Doris was a nun who, um, I'm gonna to have to move because I can stop this stuff. Uh, who, um, hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna have to ask somebody to turn that off. Hey, no, I'm on the I'm on, I'm on the phone here. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, so Doris is a is a um, a scholar who was uh, famous for her 2018 Voices of Faith event uh, talk, where she talked about her uh, abuse by a high level uh, congregation for the Doctrine of Faith official who resigned after she told her story of rape and abuse by him. And so she continues to advocate in this area and she's a very, very um, powerful woman to listen to. So we're, we're looking forward to that. And then on the 27th, uh, we have uh, uh, Brian Massengill, Father Brian Massengill, who uh, will get our Louis Trevison Award. He is a professor at Fordham University, has written Racism and the Catholic Church. He is one of the most prophetic uh, voices within the Catholic Church right now in terms of our, um, our work for uh, the needed work uh, to uh, become anti-racist within our church and to heal the racism that uh, has affected us so deeply. So that's a bit of what's going on. We're always cooking up something new, so uh, stay tuned for new things coming up. Uh, so I Right now, I'm going to lead us in our final prayer. So as we talk about uh, St. Mary of Magdala, um, I led this prayer 
uh, this past Sunday with the Catholic Women Council, which was a, a gathering of women from all over the world led by the Indian women theologians. And so I will pray with you. Dear God, like St. Mary Magdala, please make us prophetically dangerous women and men. May we be women and men who acknowledge our power to change and grow and be radically alive for God. May we be healers of wounds and writers of wrongs. May we weep with those who weep and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. May we cherish children, embrace the elderly, stand in solidarity with those pushed to the margins, and empower those impoverished by unjust economic, social, and political structures. May we pray deeply and teach wisely. May we, may we be strong and gentle leaders May we sing songs of joy and talk down fear. May we never hesitate to let passion push us, conviction compel us, and righteous anger energize us. May we strike fear into all that is unjust and evil in the world. May we dismantle abusive systems and silence lies with truth. May we shine like stars in a darkened generation. May we overflow with goodness in the name of God and by the power of Jesus the Christ. And in that name and by that power, may we change the world. Dear God, like St. Mary of Magdala, Please make us prophetically dangerous women and men. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deb. And thank you again to all of you for joining us. It was just a lovely evening and uh, a great way to spend a Tuesday night and uh, to sort of bring our celebration of Mary of Magdala this year to uh, close for now. Um, but uh, certainly, as Deb said, keep your eyes open because we're always cooking up something new. So great to be with all of you. Thank you for your support and for your encouragement and for joining us tonight. Be well.